What I would um, uh, like to talk to you about today is um, um, the scientific advice that EFSA is providing to the Commission and the Member States uh, regarding carbohydrates and carbohydrate-containing uh, foods, in which context this advice is given, and mostly how it's used by risk managers of the Commission and the Member States, which, uh, you know, uh, in uh, Europe, these uh, two parts are quite separated. So how they are using uh, the advice EFSA is providing them in order to make legislation for food labeling, but also to set nutrition goals for each member state, food yet to be based, uh, food based yet to guidelines and nutrition recommendations for the population. So uh, this, all this scientific assessment is done by the NDA panel that has 21 members and that also provides advice on uh, novel food. This is about safety, pure safety. Uh, also, about infant formula, dietetic foods, upper levels of intake, vitamins and minerals, and food allergens for uh, labeling. So, uh, I'm going to talk today about dietary reference values uh, and uh, health claims. Uh, starting with uh, DRBs for carbohydrates and dietary fiber in 2010, EFSA provided advice on DRBs for uh, glycemic carbohydrate, for, uh, sorry, carbohydrates and dietary fiber for the European population. These are DRBs, are not nutrition goals, are not food-based dietary guidelines, are not nutrition recommendations. So for total uh, glycemic carbohydrates, that advice uh, was based on the fact that low-carb, high-fat diets, we heard that in the first presentation today, consumed at libitum are associated with an increase in body weight, but the data was insufficient to set a lower threshold of intake for carbohydrates on this basis. Uh, there is also the fact that high carb diets uh, adversely affect uh, lipid profile, we are talking about 75% of uh, energy from carbohydrates or more. And then there also the data was insufficient to set a total upper level of intake for carbohydrates. So EFSA established a reference intake range for carbohydrates going to 45% to 60% of uh, the energy, the total energy. Um, on, uh, and that was based um, uh, on the fact that the combi uh, in these diets, in combination with reduced intakes of fat and saturated fatty acids, are compatible with the improvement of metabolic risk factors for chronic disease, as well as with mean carbohydrate intakes observed in some European countries. Uh, the advice on sugars, uh, also this one, was based uh, on the fact that frequent consumption of sugar-containing foods increase the risk of dental caries, especially when prophylactic measures were insufficient. But the available data really was not enough to set an upper level for sugar intake, also because uh, the risk for caries was not only uh, based on the amount of sugar consumed. On the other hand, there was also some evidence that high intakes of sugars in the form of uh, sugar sweet beverage could contribute to weight gain. But again, the evidence was not enough to set an upper level for sugars. So EFSA didn't establish any DRB for sugars, but asked member states to consider uh, that these facts should be considered when establishing nutrition goals for populations and recommendations for individuals and for setting food-based dietary, food dietary guidelines at national level. Regarding dietary fiber, uh, the 25 grams per day DRB was based on the wall fiber and bowel function, but there was also acknowledged that in adults, higher intakes of fiber were positively associated uh, in, uh, with, uh, negatively associated, I meant with the risk of coronary heart disease and type 2 diabetes and weight maintenance, and probably this could also be taken into account to establish food-based intake guidelines. Regarding the glycemic index and glycemic load of foods, there was some support for a role of GI and GL in the treatment of type 2 diabetes, and some evidence suggesting that lowering GI and, G and GL may have favorable, favorable effects on some metabolic risk factors, such as serum lipids, uh, but the evidence regarding their role in the prevention of diet-related diseases 
in the general healthy population, but that is the target population for DSPs, was still inconclusive. And uh, I want to remind you that these therapies for carbohydrates and dairy fibers were set in 2010. So another area in which EFSA uh, is given advice regarding carbohydrates, carbohydrate containing foods, is in the area of uh, nutrition health claims under the European regulation. I uh, want to remind you that the nutrient cla I mean, all claims in Europe uh, need pre-authorization since the regulation entered into force 2006, but the regulation was already approved with an annex that is listing a series of nutrient claims that are authorized for use in Europe. That annex is a live document, let's say, can be modified at any time upon request of the Commission and Member States after EPSA's advice. That was the case for the claims on rich omega-3 fatty acids and uh, the claims like you know, no cholesterol, rich in lycopene, and also low GI are um, forbidden in Europe at the moment. Um, that could change in the future, and we can discuss that later in the panel why uh, this is so. Then, also in the context of function claims, there have been requests for claims on the reduction of prostrandial glycemic responses, but also on long-term blood glucose control. And then there have been some, very few, I must say, that remember only one uh, uh, application for a health claim uh, on the reduction of the risk of disease, in this case, and the reduction of the risk of type 2 diabetes. But of course, these claims are only authorized in Europe if they refer directly to a risk factor for disease and not to the disease itself, like lowering either fasting or uh, postprandial glycemic um, responses uh, during an OGTT. So um, EFSA is quite flexible in regarding the risk factor, if the evidence between the intake of the food and the reduction of the risk of disease is established, then the risk factor can be worked out in the, because that, that is a, a regulatory requirement, but of course is um, from a scientific point of view, the hardest evidence you can have is a reduction in the risk of disease actually. So we are trying to um, just concile the, the legislation with the scientific evidence as much as we can. Um, for the scientific and evaluation of health claims, in general, uh, Epson is to ask uh, three main questions. Uh, is asking to the applicants three main questions. Whether the food constituent is defined and characterized, whether the claimed effect is defined and is a, physiological benefi uh, a beneficial physiological effect, and whether a cause and effect relationship is established between the consumption of the food and the claim effect, but also for the target group under the conditions of use. So there are a lot of constraints uh, to get a positive evaluation for health claims in this area. Um, uh, I also want to remind you that um, claims on disease populations, health claims on food, some disease populations are forbidden in Europe, those are medicinal claims, so um, even if the patients cannot be the target group for health claim, uh, they, uh, studies in patients could be used for the scientific substantiation of health claims for the general population in certain circumstances. So it's up to the applicant to define the circumstances in, in which this could be made, but it's assessed on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis. But for example, the answer would be generally yes for an, um, uh, um, the study subjects are diabetic patients treated with lifestyle measures only, diet and physical activity. Also, yes, for diabetic patients under medication, when there is evidence for a lack of interaction between the mechanism of action of the food and that of the drug on the claimed effect. And the answer would be no when there is a lack of that evidence. So, as the conclusions can be yes or no, even if here you have three different conclusions in EFSA opinions. Yes is cause and effect has been established. No is both insufficient evidence and not established. But we thought splitting the no could give more advice to the industry about the amount and the type of scientific evidence that was missing in order to get a positive uh, opinion from EFSA. So these claims, the function claims, have been submitted uh, in, under the Article 13.1 list. I must say, that the process for the evaluation of those claims was not really very well defined in Europe. There was no possible dialogue 
with the applicant. The FSA didn't even know who was the applicant for those claims. Um, there were a large number of claims covered uh, by EFSA in a very short period of time, so we couldn't look at all of them at the same time. Just uh, It was a learning process also for EFSA. And generally, there was uh, poor quality of the information provided, also because this clustering of the claims that was done um, at, at the commission level was distorting a little the type of claims that needs to was provided. So I think uh, it was a learning process for everybody. But then uh, we have the health claiming applications under Article 13.5. And here, the process uh, is really very well defined. Dialogue with the applicant is possible through clock stop letters, phone calls during the evaluation process. Um, the opinions were, uh, I mean, we have legal deadlines for the adoption of the opinions. And uh, the drawback, I think, is that this is, was meant to be a fast track procedure. Uh, and uh, industry was uh, very interested in that. But then uh, the legal constraint is that incident supply the, any uh, additional evidence that is requested by EFSA within 15 days. And that's getting a very difficult um, part of the process, I will say, for the food industry. So we have three uh, type of food constituents for which claims on uh, the production of post-standard glucose responses have been applied for. The first one are food constituents that, when added to carbohydrate-containing foods, could reduce the postprandial blood glucose responses. So here, there is an equal contact of available carbohydrates in the test and in the control food. That is what we call the, the um, constituent could have an independent effect uh, on the claim. Uh, then, uh, second, we had uh, claims on food constituents that when replacing carbohydrates that are known to increase blood glucose, then will reduce uh, blood glucose responses, and that is a replacement effect. So I'm replacing glycemic carbohydrates by non-glycemic carbohydrates or digestible carbohydrates by non-digestible carbohydrates. So that's a very easy claim. <laughs> And then uh, we have claims where, uh, that were on the property of digestible carbohydrates. So also here, uh, equal content of carbohydrates, of available carbohydrates in the test and the controlled foods. An example for this is the claims on the slow digestible starch. And an example for uh, case two are, um, you know, intense sweeteners, sugar alcohols, uh, dietary fiber. And also an example for the third one was dietary fiber, not when it's replacing glycemic carbohydrates, but when it's added to um, glycemic carbohydrates. Here, uh, only for your information, you have uh, uh, the real food constituents uh, that, uh, for which uh, health claims have been requested in Europe. You have in orange, the ones with a positive outcome. In um, purple, the ones with a negative outcome. I'm not going to go through that. Uh, but I guess the presentation will be available to you. And here are uh, sa the same for food constituents submitted in health, uh, health claims applications under Article 13.5. Why so many unfavorable uh, opinions from EFSA uh, for these claims? There are many, many reasons, but uh, some of them are here in the slides um, for you to think about. Uh, one main reason was that the food was not sufficiently described in these claims for identific assessment. That includes dietary fiber in general. Different type of fibers may have different effects, which you don't need to do to establish DRBs, but yes, for, for health claims. Low GI, uh, low GL carbohydrates. It was really very poorly described what, what, the, what, what was that. You know, different applicants have different ideas. And these claims were all together to EFSA, so it was not possible to sort that out. Then, uh, of course, there is another issue, is whether uh, evidence is provided that the claim is a beneficial physiological effect. We have some claims on amino acids and protein hydrogenates, increasing insulin secretion, and no evidence was, was provided that why that was a beneficial physiological effect for the general population and not for diabetics. And then, of course, um, in many uh, circumstances, the studies, the human studies that were provided um, were not supporting the claim. Well, sometimes there were no human studies at all. But in some other 
cases there were a lot of methodological flaws in the studies provided. Um, some study, some immune studies were not providing on insulinemic responses, for example, mm -hmm. and some others were justly done in patients under medication with no rationale why that should also work in healthy people. And uh, only my last slide, very quickly, uh, just reminding you the gap that is between the scientific assessment and of a health claim, a positive assessment, and the authorization of that claim in the European marker. So there are many things that um, uh, risk managers need to consider uh, after the F's opinion is published until they authorize the claim. And some of them are depicted in this um, uh, slide. They need to consider that claims cannot imply that food is unsafe. And the wording of some claims can imply that. For example, uh, claims like sugar increases blood glucose responses, replacing sugar by X helps maintain a normal glycemia, for example. So that may imply that sugars are unsafe, and that is forbidden in the legislation. Uh, they need to consider as well whether a claim may lead to excessive consumption of a food. They need to consider safety aspects which are not assessed in the uh, context of health claims by EFSA, because um, in the health claims regulation, food is safe, and then it does not include a safety assessment. Uh, so they can ask in the second step for that assessment to EFSA. Claims cannot refer to a property that is common for all foods. For example, reduces glycemic responses compared to glucose. It may be true for almost virtually all foods. Okay? Uh, the feasibility of implementation, how enforcement authorities can check whether uh, the properties of the food match the label, and also consumer understanding. As, uh, uh, the wording for health claims that EFSA gives is scientifically based and does not take into account consumer understanding. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sylvia. That's excellent.